Hi everybody, Mr. Shins here, streaming uh, Bright Oak tonight. So I'm going to switch on over. Uh, when I last did this, we had just ended Chapter 2, so I backed up a little bit here. Uh, hopefully <laughs> the levels are okay, You're, uh, you can hear everything all right. Um, so uh, last time we discovered that uh, um, I'm I'm, I, Mr. Shins, am, am trapped in Bright Oak uh, by this anomaly. Everybody here is trapped. They're running out of resources. And as Patty has just said, she doesn't know how to send me home. And we're probably all going to be here a little while. So let's jump right in. Chapter 3. It feels like a joke. It must be. But even the impossible is seeming likelier now that the chance... Then the chance the town, the people, the shooting, and the apparent trap closed around me are all merely an elaborate setup. Whatever it is, though, it feels like I'm the punchline. To my supreme embarrassment, I can feel tears forming. Not quiet, stoic sniffles either, but messy, hysterical crying I can barely hold back. I swallow hard, gripping my hands together tightly enough to feel the skin bruising. After a moment, a hand rests on my shoulder. Enough. Of course, we all have many questions, our time traveler included, I am sure. But I say we do away with formalities a little. Sitting in these uncomfortable chairs with nothing to do but stare, it feels like a zoo. Better to talk over coffee and maybe the dinner some of us are missing. That is, if our sheriff says the meeting is done. <clears throat> You're right, as always. Meeting adjourned, everyone. Anybody who wants to is welcome to head to Patty's. The walk isn't long, two doors down to be exact, but it's enough time to get a grip on myself. The initial burst of emotion has thankfully given way to a dull exhaustion and the sense that none of this is actually happening to me. After all, time travel is impossible, not without a wormhole or a DeLorean or magic. You did say there was still dinner to be had. It will be cold, but yes. I realize that the tall woman, Patty, has been supporting me as we walk, just as she nods to Mary Beth to take her place and moves to unlock the door. I shake my head to indicate I can stand on my own, and Mary Beth looks relieved. The night, in contrast to my emotional turmoil, is calm and warm. It's also incredibly dark. I consider using the flashlight on my phone, but think better of it. I can hear crickets sounding not too far off, and the stars are brilliant without city lights to compete with. Squinting at the building before us in the scant moonlight, I notice the windows have been boarded up, and there seem to be several padlocks on the door in addition to the deadbolt. Puzzled, I look up at the sign. Patty's Plates? Yes, I was going to name it Patty's Place, but... As the final lock gives way, she pulls the door open, disappearing into the darkness of the cafe. A moment later, a camping lantern lights up inside. My nephew, when he heard it, he thought I said Patty's plates because it's my cafe and I cook. I like his version better. She appears in the doorway again, silhouetted by the comparatively bright, inviting glow from inside. Come in, everyone. The cafe is cozy, and while less than half the meeting's attendees were curious, brave, or hungry enough to follow, every seat available is soon occupied around the few small tables and the modest bar. The light from the lantern on the bar and a few flickering satellite candles is enough to see by, if not well. We lost electricity during the event, probably because the power plant is on the base, outside the apparent boundary. The Grange has a backup generator we use for evening meetings, and a few folks like Patty have personal generators they use at their discretion while they still work. But for everyone else, it's lights out after dark, or even rationing candles at this point. Behind the counter, I can hear Patty rustling quietly in the gloom when the sound of coffee being brewed. Thankfully, we don't rely on the base for water. We'd be in worse shape if we did. And good thing the creek isn't running this time of year, or it's possible we'd all be underwater by now. How you figure that? Would water be trapped by the boundaries too? She nods grimly. 
Yes, everything, except air, presumably. It doesn't feel like it's getting harder to breathe, or not yet anyway. Maybe it just extends high enough we wouldn't notice yet. The boundary is right at our back door, so I spent the first week throwing literally everything I could at the wall just to see. But it doesn't seem to matter whether the material is organic or inorganic, alive or dead. I hesitate to ask. I found a dead rat on the roadside. Anyway, I posited that if the wall was meant to trap us specifically, it would of course stop things like cars from passing, but might let other things through like animals or plant matter. But it doesn't. I even pitched that lazy orange barn cat at it, came back through just like anything else. It bit me too. She flexes her hand, examining it. Patty steps out from behind the counter with a brimming tray, placing a steaming mug half filled with coffee in front of me. Serves you right. Oh, and serves you right. Probably, but it was an experiment. The point is, nothing that I can find gets through once it's in. So on the upside, at least it, is, it isn't certain that it's a deliberate trap meant for us in particular. And isn't that a relief? This telephone of yours, Mr. Shins, does it work? It has no wires, so does it call without connecting to the outside? Everyone looks to me. I grimace, pulling it out cautiously. It doesn't quite work like that. It might be wireless, but it still needs to be able to connect to specific infrastructure to function. I got lost in part because that infrastructure was spotty in my own time. It's definitely not going to be available in yours. How do we even know it's a telephone then? We only have your word on what that device is and does. I swallow, looking at the man seated at the bar. The candle flames reflect eerily in his eyes. His fist is resting on the counter, and I can all too easily imagine a pitchfork in its grip. I suppose you have a point, Lloyd, but there's no call to raise hostilities in Patty's house. John is openly and liberally spiking his coffee from his flask, which he then offers to Sparrow, who tips a small amount into his own coffee before passing it back. Patty plunks a half mug full, oh, a half full mug down in front of the man, Lloyd. You said it was a smartphone. Does that mean it knows things, as in contains information? I nod. It's a mini computer. I'm not, sh not that I'm sure you know what I mean by that. She gestures impatiently. So explain it to me. To us, please, and thank you. Mary Beth rolls her eyes. All right, um, basically, I can use it to take pictures and store and play music and videos. It has a calculator and a few games. When I've got a wireless connection, I can access the internet, which is, um, it's hard to explain, but it's a massive network that allows you to connect to all kinds of information and can communicate with people all over the world. Sure, it can do all that. You just can't prove any of it. We understand. Irritated, I meet the sheriff's eyes across the table. He grins and nods, though he immediately looks like he regrets it, glancing at Patty nervously. She has put the tray down and merely watches me expectantly, hands on hips. Mary Beth sees me lift my phone and looks ready to pop with suppressed excitement. What should I start with? I don't want to make them more nervous than they already are. Okay, um, I am going to I can play music, show a text exchange, play a game, or show pictures. Um, let's go ahead and play music. It's right at the top. What isn't going to make them nervous? This is weird future technology as far as they're concerned. Might as well do something fun. I search for a name they might know. I mean, I'm pretty sure Ziggy Stardust is 70s, but is David Bowie around? He ain't the hack with the harmonica, is he? You're thinking of Bob Dylan. Beg pardon, Miss Billboard. I think of him as little as possible. Okay, not Bowie or Dylan, got it. Uh, who do you listen to? Sparrow cocks his head quizzically, a slight smile pulling at his mouth. I'm fond of Phil Oakes, if... That another of the guitar bums? Sparrow sighs and I shoot him a rueful smile. Unfortunately, I don't have any Phil Oakes downloaded. Mm. I have Miles Davis though, or... Oh! The room waits expectantly as I scroll quickly through my road trip playlist. Of course. I tap play, turning up the volume as high as I can. The room freezes, listening intently as the opening strains of Eleanor Rigby come through on my tinny cell phone speakers. I see the British have invaded the future as well, apparently. 
Sparrow shakes his head wonderingly. You can take that and play it anywhere, at any time, without a record? You can, and the sound isn't really meant to be played through the phone speakers. I've got earbuds, uh, that is, headphones, that I use. But then only one person could hear it at a time. Do you have any of your music? I mean, from the future? From your time? I go back to my albums, trying to figure out what is most likely to appeal to her. I fight back a smile, opting for Beyonce. If the room was surprised before, it is now stunned into complete silence. Sparrow's hand moves to cover his mouth, but his eyes are ablaze. As everyone still seems frozen halfway in, I stop the song. Well, that certainly sounded like it came from the future. Do girls truly run your world? This world in the 2000s? No, though Beyonce comes close. Did you like it? Sparrow nods, so the rest of the room seems ambivalent at best. That was... it was different than I expected. I don't know. Do you have more? The sheriff interjects before, kind of re before I can reply. I think we might be straying from the point a little. Well, I am now sure this is not something from our time. Also, it does not seem to be intended to cause harm. Are we all convinced? Yes? The group murmurs agreement. Patty is almost the same height as the sheriff, and she carries herself with a quiet dignity that commands attention, and when she can apparently, oh, and which she can apparently turn on and off at will as it suits her. Yes, ma'am, I think we are. Then we agree. Drink your coffee. I'll get food out in a moment. The malcontent at the bar apparently has not been appeased, but is unable to vent his frustration in the face of my newfound social acceptance. Glowering, he turns his back to me. Patty, I know we're rationing, but this coffee is practically water. It has no flavor. Her eyes flick over him carelessly. Good, I made it that way for you, especially as you have no taste. Patty doesn't stop plating as he shoves out of the room. The pair of remaining holdouts that had come in with Lloyd follow him out, leaving only the group at our table and Patty. I call dibs on Lloyd's dinner. Sparrow smiles reassuringly at me. Don't worry about it. Can't win ever. Can't win over everyone. What is dinner, anyhow? A plate appears beside my watery coffee, a small daub of yellowish paste in the middle. Cornmeal mush with wild onion and pepper. Her voice is resigned. I realize suddenly I've probably overcomplicated things. I position the plate and coffee mug in front of me, hold my phone horizontally, and snap a picture. The flash is blinding. Oops, uh, sorry about that. But here, look. I turn the screen around for the group to see, immediately feeling guilty and trying not to notice Sheriff John's hand easing slowly away from his holster. Sparrow flinching back from the table, or Patty's hand shaking as, he, as she straightens out a plate she let fall to the counter. It's only reasonable their trust is limited. I'm so sorry, I, I didn't think of the flash. That's the, but that was immediate. It didn't take any time to develop. The sheriff nods agreeably enough, sipping at the dregs of his spiked coffee, and then tucking into his second helping of mush. No question, it's quite a device. Does this smart telephone make its own energy? I shake my head, and her implication sinks in. No, and I have no way to recharge the battery here either. I should probably shut it off to conserve what's left. Everyone but Mary Beth appears relieved by this. With my phone powered down and in my pocket again, the conversation lapses. I shuffle through the many questions, cluttering my thoughts, trying to determine where to start. Uh, okay, so we can ask questions now. Um, how long has the town been like this? What is the state of your supplies? Are you running out of food? What is or was the event she talked about? Uh, let's do, how long has the town been like this? Four weeks to the day. I swear quietly under my breath. It is not the entire town that is like this. Some people live outside the boundary, like my brother and his family. I almost wish they were inside the boundary. At least then we'd have a source of food with the farm. Sparrow shoots her a reproachful look, and a surprised yelp and subsequent sulfurous glance at her brother suggests Sheriff John may also have implied her words were insensitive, despite his own anodyne expression. I said almost. Of course I'm glad Ernesto and Paulina are caught up in this, especially with the kids. I know what you meant. The food supply makes me worry as well. 
Even if the farm had been within the affected part of town, it'd mean more mouths to feed. That was never meant to be more than a family farm, so it's not likely to have made much of a difference to supply. Have you made any progress against the boundary at all? In a word, no. The baldness of her reply speaks volumes. We've at least mapped the boundary roughly. First thing we did was get everyone out to the border to test for weak points and see how far it stretched. Three mile diameter at the widest point, just under two miles at the narrowest. We check it again once a week now on the off chance some part will thin enough to break through and to make sure it isn't getting smaller. This unpleasant consideration returns everyone to moody silence. Okay, um, what's the event? No one answers right away. We don't really know what it is exactly, but it started this whole mess. It happened in the evening when everyone was heading home for the day. There was a roaring, rushing sound, and then after a long time, a sort of pop, like swinging a bullwhip around and around very quickly, and then cracking it. She shudders, her eyes, eyes closed. After the big crack, it was quiet again. There were strange, bright lights outside as well. I thought it might be a missile or a warhead. The sheriff's expression is dour. I thought it might be the Soviets too, but nothing went up in flames with a bang, just that drawn out grumbling in the lights. I left the cafe, hopped in the truck, and went to investigate what in the Sam Hill was going on. Figured the military folks up the road would know. And you ran into the wall? He nods once, his eyes briefly mirroring the confusion and mounting panic I felt when I threw myself at the boundary earlier. The boundary was all lit up, shining like ice. I stopped to look at it, same place you came through, and when the noise stopped, the lights did too. So I started up the truck again, only to hit the wall and try to cross on foot, but well, you know how that goes. I swallow, my throat constricting. Once I knew I couldn't get through, I hurried back to the house to check on Mary Beth. Mary Beth hid at home and waited. Even on short acquaintance, that seems out of character. Mary Beth is flushed and chagrined. Reading my thoughts on my face, she puts up her chin defensively. defensively. I had been taking a nap. I slept through it. And when I woke her up to tell her about it, she accused me of being a drunken sot and dreaming the whole thing. I had to pick her up and put her in the truck to go see for herself. There's one amusement that, fl that flickers briefly on his face before dying out leaving him ashen and hopeless for an unguarded moment. He doesn't believe there's any chance of escape. The realization chills me. After that, it was just a matter of rounding up everyone we could find, comparing notes, and doing the best we can with the situation. Wish we'd known then it would be a longer haul, but we got things ironed out before the real desperation point, so to speak. You are a good sheriff, John, and Bright Oak is fortunate because we are a close community used to relying on each other. A different place might be less cooperative and even and in even greater peril because of it. Um, are you running out of food? Good question. We are careful with what we have left, but people still must eat, and there is no more food coming in than is here already. When the meat was all gone, John started to take those with guns out to hunt squirrels or rabbits, but there are not so many animals either. And ammunition is in short supply too, since certain parties object to keeping it in stock. Sparrow is studying his empty coffee cup intently. I don't know that it'll be a bad thing if the ammo runs out before the food does, all told. People are starting to get desperate as it is. I suppose that's true, but it won't much be much comfort when we only have our bare hands to catch rabbits and birds with. The sheriff pats her head consolingly. Don't you worry, Mayor Beth. If it comes to that, I'll send you out with the family sword. <coughs> Excuse me. Patty smoothly interjects before another squabble can erupt. We have done the best we can, and I think we are doing well. Sheriff John collected all resources to get together here, and with help from the cooking rotation, I present three meals every day to the town. Everyone eats. No one eats too much. It is fair. All we can do is pray that we will be free before the supplies are gone. Amen to that. And what is the state of supplies like? I'm surprised to see everyone look to Sparrow, who considers the question with furrowed brow. Hmm. 
Not the best it could be in some cases, but not the worst. Candles are running low, yes, though we began rationing what little we have is lasting longer. Though since we began rationing what little we have is lasting longer. An advantage of the town being so far in the hills is we order in bulk to avoid the cost of more frequent deliveries. Soap, toothpaste, paper goods, bandages, even matches we have a decent store of. Aspirin, nails, socks, not too bad. Cigarettes and tobacco are nearly gone. Perishables have, of course, been consumed or, well, perished. We have enough tea to last until doomsday. On account of nobody but Sparrow drinking this stuff, though coffee is obviously another story. I passed all canned and dried food stuffs along to Patty as soon as it was clear we weren't going to be getting out anytime soon. Bill, uh, one of the other folks stuck here, has been taking out a group of men regularly to cut firewood as needed. All other fuel is as good as gone, though. Do you keep any actual inventory? Sparrow turns to face her, eyes wide and innocent. What do you mean? Like, with exact numbers, tracking all the items in stock? <coughs> I'm getting coughing here. <coughs> Excuse me. Mary Beth appears disgusted and horrified, and even Patty is looking at him ensconce. Sheriff John merely continues chasing the final crumbs of cornmeal around his plate with a pat of his thumb. Sparrow sighs wearily. The endless trains of the faithless. Of course I do. I don't tend to carry it around with me on the off chance I'll be pulled in for an unplanned meet and greet with a time traveler, but if it will help you sleep at night, Mary Beth, I will endeavor to do so going forward. The sheriff stops short of actually looking his plate clean, finally giving the conversation his full attention again. That won't be necessary. Just keep giving me the Monday updates unless something's run out. Children, all of you. <clears throat> Sparrow smiles placatingly at her, then the fulminating Mary Beth, before turning to me. There are also a number of books available if you are interested. I keep something of an unofficial library running out of the store. Novels, encyclopedias, collected essays. It's an eclectic mix, but there is no frigate like a book to take us lands away. The sheriff rears back from the table uneasily. <coughs> If you're waxing poetic, I think that means we've covered the state of supplies. I just say thank you. Anything else you want to know? Uh, nothing I'm sure you'll have answers to. Patty turns to the sheriff abruptly. Where will he be staying, sheriff? The sheriff stares back at her, clearly stumped. That's a good question. The reality of staying in Bright Oak hadn't previously set in for me. <coughs> Please excuse me, I think I'm going to need to get some water. I'll be right back. I'm going to switch over to the Be Right Back screen.
All right, pardon me. <clears throat> I was working out in the dust today, so I think I've got a, a system full of dust. It's just now starting to come out when I'm trying to read. Okay, <clears throat> where was I? The reality of staying in Bright Oak hadn't previously set in for me. It's only now that it dawns I truly won't be getting back in my car tonight, continuing on to the next cheap motel. Being an outsider here doesn't remove me from the same worries and consider considerations as the rest of the town. Issues with food and supplies are my near and personal concern. Regardless of my era of origin, the present is my problem too. I have the guest room. He can stay with me. I have a spare bed too. The sheriff faces me inquiringly. Uh, Patty or Sparrow? Um, guest room sounds nice. Let's stay with Patty. Or we can stay with Sparrow. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. <clears throat> Let's stay with Patty. Nope, I changed my mind. We're staying with Sparrow. The sheriff raises his eyebrows but shrugs. Sparrow looks almost as surprised himself but immediately covers it up with a charming crooked smile. Copacetic. It'll be nice to have the company. Accommodations aren't fancy but should be comfortable enough. Mary Beth looks dubious but says nothing. Thanks for settling that, Madam Mayor. I look at Patty curiously. You're the mayor? She shrugs phlegmatically. Our sheriff likes to tease. It is only a joke of sorts. Bright Oak is, is small, much too small for a mayor. It's no joke. She's the closest we've got to a leader. Heck, Patty could be president if she put her mind to it. Just try going against her will when it's said, if, you don't, if and you don't believe me. <clears throat> I don't doubt it. She shoots the sheriff a repressive frown. This part is the Gutierrez family, my family, has been here almost as long as there has been a California. So in this small pond, we are big fish. My brother does not much care to leave his ranch, so I am the face of my family in town, that is all. It's enough. The bland expression Patty turns on her prompts me to interject. I'm very glad to have a place to say, but obviously my arrival is going to be a further drain on resources. What can I do to help? The group glance at one another. You can't stay for nothing. Oh, we'll find you an occupation, never fear. <laughs> no such thing as a free ride in Bright Oak these days. <laughs> it is not hospitable to make a guest work, but Sparrow grins wryly. Do you want to run errands and tend the storefront? We aren't selling anything, of course, just recording what people say they need, which I'll then review and send out with you the next day. Dole is watching Seamen dry, I'm afraid, but it needs doing. If that doesn't appeal, though, I can suffer through and let you play librarian with the books instead. I've been taking a few out daily to read aloud to some of the less mobile folks in town, which service is even appreciated on rare occasion. Uh, yeah, let's do the store. He breaks into a brilliant smile. Do you mean it? Take that off my shoulders and you can stay as long as you want, wall or no. Do you have any skills that might prove useful? Are you a good shot or anything like that? Sheriff interrupts before I can respond. We're pretty solid on hunting detail. Meaning no offense, Mr. Shins, but I don't think handing arms off to a stranger is likely to prove a popular choice, all told. In your own best interest, as well as that of the town, we'll skip that hurdle. It'll cause ripples as it stands, having you staying so near our supply stores. <coughs> I hadn't thought of that aspect. He sounds conflicted. Sheriff John gives him a sidelong look. If I thought it was worth concern, I'd have said so. Patty folds her arms, calm demeanor slipping into impatience. I am not concerned. Only the idle have time to worry about maybes. We have enough worries without making any up. Too much idle time as well, if we're honest. He murmurs the words, but Mary Beth nods in agreement. I've often thought lately that the general mood would benefit if everyone could do a full hard day's work instead of simply puttering around with whatever they can and getting caught up in fears and what ifs. The way is suspicious, the result uncertain, perhaps destructive. Lewis, in particular, could use a real job to set his mind to. Might clear out some of the mental cobwebs gathering on tomes and the healthy flock of bats occupying his belfry. You wound me. I do not know much poetry, 
But suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Romans 5.3, we struggle on and we do not give up hope. The sheriff looks like a rabbit caught in headlights. So uh, do you have any particular skills that might be of use here, leaving aside shooting and a stomach for arbitrary bits of quotation? I rack my brain, blurting out the first thing to come to mind. <clears throat> I have some mixed martial arts training. I can type 105 words per minute. I built my own computer. I can read and play a couple instruments. I'm able to run a six minute mile. Oh, I'm very fast. I can quote every line in my favorite film from memory. <clears throat> uh, I actually have built my own computer. I'm the computer I'm playing on, I built, so let's do this one. That sounds like a good skill. The bright encouragement in her voice is reminiscent of a kindergarten teacher. <clears throat> is that like building a car? A little bit, I guess. A real car or a model car? I mean, neither one because it's a computer, but probably closer to a real car. There are circuits involved, power management, concerns with overheating. Are you able to build one here? Uh, no, I don't have the parts. Ah, well, I'm sorry. I guess I don't have any skills that are really applicable to the current situation. A few of us, <clears throat> I'm gonna take another sip of water. Few of us do. Do not let it cause you more suffering. Your skills are life skills, not meant for life and death. That is not a bad thing. <clears throat> if it makes you feel any better, my only value is running the store. Only ask Mary Beth and she'll gladly point out my utter lack of personal utility. Lewis, it's not... I, I don't... Sparrow raises a skeptical eyebrow, but his expression thaws as Mary Beth continues struggling to contradict him. <clears throat> <coughs> it's all right. I mean in the current context. I know my own worth. Mr. Shins hopefully knows his, too. Instead of being reassured, she appears annoyed. Don't get too carried away. I only meant that if we run out of food, you're the first one. Enough, belly aching. Helping out Sparrow is as good a start as any, as far as I'm concerned. We're none of us, we none of us were running like cogs in a well-oiled machine right out the gate. And you're already less of a pain in the ass than old Randall Briggs. <clears throat> Redirecting her contempt, Mary Beth lets out an inelegant snort. Briggs is a pretty low bar to clear. It's something, I suppose. Who's he? The sheriff shakes his head slowly. Uh, Randall was a tiresome and a social curmudgeon even before we were all trapped here. For weeks now, he's been holed up in his place and refusing to leave, share supplies, or do more than holler out an open window Sundays to ask if we're free yet and say he's still alive and kicking. <clears throat> Which information always gives us great relief, I assure you. I glance in Patty's direction, recalling her upbeat line about the closeness of the community. To my surprise, she grins mischievously at me in response, a dimple peeking from her right cheek. A bad apple, certainly but he does not spoil the bunch. Are you referring to Randall or Lewis? Sparrow sighs. Oh, now, now, clearly I am a black sheep, not a bad apple. Quit mixing your metaphors. The sheriff stands up, stretching and giving a gusty yawn. I think matters are as settled as their level to get for the night. You can all stay up and enjoy your witty repartee, but I'm for bed myself. It's barely 8.30, if that. <clears throat> this seems to be the cue to break up the party. The rest of the group stands and we filter outside, Patty blowing out the candles before emerging with the still lit lantern in hand. As she turns to lock up the front door again, Sparrow taps my shoulder gingerly. You'll get used to it soon. No electricity, remember? It's funny how quickly the body adjusts to the notion of sleeping when it's dark and waking when it's light. I can barely make out his face in the gloom. Uh, thanks. Here's hoping. Good night, folks. Be safe walking home. Good night, all. Sleep well. We will see you at breakfast. Good night. <laughs> My voice is quiet. For all the welcome I've been given, I still feel like an interloper among what is clearly an established group of, if not friends exactly, then at least close comrades. Well then, 
It's been an exciting day, rather more for you than us, even, I imagine. Are you exhausted? I follow his disembodied voice along the quiet avenue, stars brilliant overhead. Yes, but not particularly sleepy, to be honest. It'll take a few days, if you're anything like me. In the meantime, we can't use candles or oil frivolously, but if you don't mind the smoke, I use light from the wood-burning stove to stay up and read on evenings I can't sleep. It's a big cast-iron beast, but if you leave the door jar, it lets out just enough light. Only make sure you don't mind the book you're reading getting a little singed. We walk on, the stillness of the evening broken only by cricket song. Sparrow stops in front of a square structure, a short block from the cafe. Here we are. I hear him working the lock, then the door protesting as it creaks open. He pushes through into the deeper, more complete inner darkness while I hesitate on the threshold. Just as I begin to wonder if I'm supposed to follow, a loud metallic crash sounds almost immediately echoed by a dull thud. Shit, I mean, ouch. I'm all right, wait there just a moment more. Light blossoms in the darkness and Sparrow returns to me with an old oil lamp in hand. His face is a little pink in the shimmering light. I'm so sorry. Four weeks now and I still forget to place a lamp by the door in the morning. Always an adventure when getting back after dark. <clears throat> I follow him into the faintly illuminated storefront, squinting to see an old-fashioned counter, lines of racks and crates, empty jars, and a mishmash of items crammed and scattered around the shelf-lined walls. The air smells of stale pipe smoke, old coffee, and dust. Once he locks up behind me, Sparrow looks around the shadowed room distastefully. Welcome to the Morgan Family Store, established 1927. You'll be able to revel in its full glory in the morning. For now, he steps through a gap in the counter and opens a door along the far wall. Living quarters are back here. The room that comes into view is much smaller as well as more cluttered. The light shines off framed photographs, marigold wallpaper, and a collection of brightly upholstered chairs, plant stands, and tables circling a hulking stove against one side of the room. The almost ghostly odors from the storefront are only slightly more concentrated in the living section. Somehow, so are the number of books. Sparrow threads through the furniture with a practice born of long familiarity. Little of the overstuffed last century kitsch I can see seems associated with Sparrow, but having just met him, I hesitate to say anything. Bathrooms on the left. You have your choice of bedrooms, actually, but I think you'll be most comfortable in my old room. Catching a desiccated houseplant I carelessly unbalanced, I settle it back on its stand and follow him into a short, narrow hallway. Aren't you sleeping in your room? I can narrowly make out his expression in the light. No, it's not my room anymore, so you're welcome to it. I'll be sleeping in the library. It's set up in the back of the store. The room he leads me to is comparatively spartan, barren paneled walls, an empty dresser, and a wooden twin bed covered in a handmade quilt. Shaking out the coverlet, Sparrow opens a, hollow, a shallow closet, peering inside critically. Anything in there is yours for the taking. I think there are a few flannel nightshirts at least. They're clean, though I don't know how long it's been since they last saw light. Probably more comfortable than what you're wearing, if nothing else. Muted banging echoes from the door of the storefront. We both go still. Sparrow, are you there? The voice is muffled through the walls, but recognizable. I can palpably feel Sparrow's tension release somewhat. Just a moment. I wait in the darkness of the room as he leaves with the lamp. Without the light, the walls feel like they are creeping in on me, heavy and close. And I, can and I can suddenly sympathize with Sparrow's decision to give up his old room. After hearing the door creak open and a subsequent exchange of soft voices, the light returns before claustrophobia can truly set in. The sheriff wraps his knuckles on the doorframe briefly before entering. Mr. Shins, I'm sorry to trouble you. <clears throat> what is it, Sheriff? He makes a face. If you're going to stick around, John will do just fine. Look, I'll be honest, this might be nothing, but a thought started nagging at me and wouldn't let up. He closes his eyes, formulating his next words carefully. It's about our mutual friend, Dr. Lee, the army doctor. 
fellow you took a dislike to? As soon as he mentions the stranger, I know why he's here. I only wonder why it didn't occur to me sooner. Oh my, you're right. I was so confused just trying to sort out what was happening, but the sheriff looks pale in the wavering light. Good God in heaven, I didn't misunderstand them. You saw him both places, here and in your time? I nod, cupping my elbows with icy hands. I was too far away to flag down his car and ask for help, but he parked, so I ran to catch up. I saw him. I saw him. And then he disappeared when he stepped over the boundary. I had no idea what I was seeing. He reappeared after I accidentally crossed myself, trying to escape the gunshots. Sparrow's eyes are wide. You're sure, Dr. Lee? He didn't introduce himself, but I, I'm certain I saw him both places, both times, I guess. He's the one that told me I was trapped. The sheriff was staring vacantly at the wall, at lost in thought, but his head swivels back to me as he considers this. Not much chance it's a different person if he knew that. What else did he tell you? Only that I was safe from the shooter on this side of the trees and that I was trapped and would probably never return home. Even before that, I thought he was odd, but... Oh! I swallow, scouring my memory for the exact words. The sheriff is clearly itching with impatience, but waits silently for me to continue. He also apologized to me. He said that he felt terrible because it was his fault I'm trapped. Is that so? I watch as the sheriff's genial, easygoing demeanor fades, his eyes hard and jaw set in the lantern light. He actually looks like a sheriff. Lock your door tonight, Sparrow, just in case he comes looking for our guest. I'll alert the patrol to keep a weather eye out for Dr. Lee. Do you think he's the reason I've been pulled into the past? The sheriff nods sharply. I do. What's more, I'm not convinced at the moment he ain't the root of our troubles, too. And we're on chapter four. Okay, I think I'm gonna call it there because my voice is suffering a little bit tonight. Um, thank you everyone who turned, uh, tuned in. Um, I will hop on another time here. Tomorrow is regularly scheduled day to stream, so I'll be on tomorrow evening at around 10 as soon as I get my kids to sleep. Um, thanks again for everybody who tuned in. I will catch you on the next one.